Today, we're gonna to be reacting to one of the most viewed videos on learning and studying that has ever been posted. It is Marty Lobdell's Study Less, Study Smart, which has been viewed 22 million times, which I think is gonna be interesting because number one, I haven't actually seen this, and number two, a lot has changed in the learning science of the last 12 years. So I'm gonna be really interested to see what Professor Lobdell has got to say. If you're new to this channel and you're wondering who the heck I am to be reacting to Professor Lobdell's talk, I'm Dr. Justin Sung and compared to Professor Lobdell, I'm really no one, but I'm a learning researcher and a learning coach and the head of learning at I Can Study. For the last 10 years, I have helped thousands of learners around the world learn more efficiently. Before we jump into the video, I would appreciate it if you could give this video a like, it really does help with the algorithm. And without further ado, Professor Lobdell, I'll hand it over to you. You. I don't, so I'm going to pick out kind of the most important things and make sure I get to those right off the bat. Let's say this is efficient studying, and I know there are no numbers there, but higher means more efficient, lower means low or no efficiency. And this axis, we're looking at time. Here's what happens for the average student. For her, six o'clock in the evening, after- Okay, I'm going to let him cook, don't worry. But it's an interesting point. The fact that there's no numbers on the axis of efficiency, that is actually something that people struggle with, is understanding how do you know whether your learning is more or less efficient. It's actually really challenging because we don't actually have a really good concept of what efficiency is. It's actually a very technical thing to try to get an understanding of. Efficient is not just covering more content in a shorter amount of time because learning is about what you're able to do with the knowledge. So you have to actually measure your efficiency based on the quality of knowledge that you're building. If, for example, you studied a lot, you know, covered a lot of content in a short period of time, but you're not able to retrieve that knowledge, or you can retrieve it, but you can only retrieve it in a very, very, very simple way, it wasn't actually efficient when you compare it to what you needed to do with that. So there's an outcome focus there. And I teach this in my program in a lot more depth, but the nutshell of this is figure out how you need to use your knowledge and then think, how long does it take for me to get to the level of retention that I need for the level of knowledge that I need. And then look at the total amount of time that it took to do that. So that includes not just the amount of time that you spend on a single day studying, but also how long does it take for you to cover all your flashcards that you need to cover, as well as any practice tests and whatever. Like the total amount of time spent to study, to reach the level of knowledge you need to retrieve and use the knowledge that you need to use it at, at the level of retention that you think is optimal and desirable and necessary. That will give you the information around your learning efficiency. Anyway, moving on. After her supper at the residency dining hall, she plopped herself down at her little study area and started studying. But here's what happened. By about 6.30, she was in a major slump. But what was her goal? To study six hours. So she continued to sit at her little desk and stare at pages until midnight. She was at her desk six hours. How long did she actually study? About 20, 30 minutes. Now, there's a simple conduct in psychology that all of you are aware of. Things that are reinforced, we tend to do more of. Things that are punished or ignored, we tend to do less of. You know, we operate by those principles to a large degree. If you're sitting there for six hours, are you feeling good? No. Once you get here, you're looking at your book going, I hate geography, I hate literature, I hate psychology, all the things we're trying to get you to fall in love with, you're hating it. And so her actual good studying was followed by five and a half hours of pain and misery. I would bet you, I don't know for a fact, that as the quarter progressed, she sat down, and finally, she was done before she even started. She sat down and just stared at a book, and she flunked every class. Now, had she taken this little seminar, or had figured things out on her own, she'd know what to do. First rule, the moment you start to slide, you're shoveling against the tide. What you need to do is what? Take a break. And here's what's cool about it. You can study for a half hour. It doesn't take a half hour break to recharge your batteries. For most people, about five minutes. And this is where you go away, do something fun for five minutes. Call a friend, talk to a child, talk to a parent, a roommate. Enjoy some music. Do something you enjoy and actually say, this is my treat for having studied for 30 minutes effectively. Go back and here's what happens. Your efficiency is nearly 100%. Study a half hour, take a break. Study a half hour, study a half hour. Now had she done that over a course of six hours, she would have got about five and a half hours of serious studying and about a half hour of total break time. I so overall, solid advice, right? I can't fault it. I would not dare to, you know, really put much fault on Marty Lobdell because he's kind of like a legend. 
honestly. But that's not actually quite accurate because what you're actually refreshed on is not your efficiency. It is your focus and attention, which is not always the same thing. If all it took to learn effectively was attention and focus, it would actually be a relatively easy thing. A lot of people can study with good focus and, and good attention for a short amount of time, but then their actual performance with that knowledge is not always the same. Again, it depends on the way that you can uh, retrieve that knowledge. So if you've ever learned something and in the same, like let's say that the teachers just explain something to you in class and you were focused and you were paying attention and you're trying to figure it out and your friend is able to figure it out and they get it and then they can explain it to you in a way that is very simple and like they've, they've clearly understood it, but you weren't able to do that. It wasn't because you weren't paying attention. It's not because you weren't focused. It's not because you weren't, you know, energetic enough. It's because you lacked the fundamental cognitive habits to process the information in a way that allowed you to make sense of it, unpack it and consolidate it back into your network. And that's a cognitive process. Taking a break doesn't necessarily mean you suddenly magically gain that skill. It is great for rejuvenating your focus, like 100%. Should you do this, rest timing? Yes, I, I strongly encourage it. It is going to allow you to stay focused for a longer period of time, 100%. Is that the thing that actually improves your learning efficiency only if your efficiency is mostly held back by declining focus and energy? Is that the case for most people? Probably for most people, a big part of their studying efficiency is capped because their focus only lasts for 20 to 30 minutes. And that will help. When you do this, you'll realize that's no longer a problem for you anymore. If you still have difficulties and you still struggle, it means that the thing that's holding you back now is something else. You still improved, you're still getting better, but now there's just another thing. And as you continue to remove these barriers, you just get better and better and better. And that's the self-regulated learning game. That's how you become an efficient learner. Let me ask you, what's the primary function of a bedroom? Sleeping. What's the secondary function? <laughs> Good. Most groups go, <laughs> I go, take Psych 20 or 225 to learn about it. It's functional, okay? Primary function of a dining table? Eating. Eating. Primary function of a living area? Okay, recreation, socializing, right? Now, a lot of students don't realize how much we're controlled by environmental cues. A piece of research then at the University of Hawaii. Researchers asked the students, what's the biggest problem with studying? They said, we can't get into it. The university in question had primarily dorm rooms. Very few commuter students to the university. Most of you have seen a dorm room? Oh, okay. Most of you have seen a dorm room. They're usually rectangular if it's a duplex. One side bed, another side of bed, everything kind of mirror image. Study area, study area, right? You've got a closet or wardrobe. So it's real interesting. In one room, you sleep, you groom, you talk with people, you socialize, you study, you snack. You're all in one room. It's a multi-purpose room. And yet you're supposed to study. If your door is open, what happens? Everybody, hey, love you, what's up? You know, and then they got to come in and talk to you. Very quickly, you can't get to studying. Well, the professors heard that the students couldn't get into studying, but they knew what the dorms looked like. In the Hawaiian dorms, all of the rooms had a gooseneck lamp. So the professor said, we're going to try a little experiment. Take that lamp, make a little sign, and put it on it, study lamp. Use it only for studying. You don't dress by it. You don't have BS sessions by it. You don't snack by it. You don't clean the room by it. Nothing. You use the other lights for all other functions. Here's the way it works, and it's so easy. Every one of you can do this. Get a little lamp. You probably have one already. If you don't, my gosh, yard sale, garage sale, you can pick them up for nothing. Get that lamp, and it becomes your study lamp. So if you have to study in your bedroom, turn your desk away from the bed. That's the, like, how many been to the mall? It makes you want to go to sleep. By the way, you can't study in the bed. It's also bad for your back if you know about posture. Turn your back to the bed, have a blank wall, have your lamp, have your books ready to go, because you can futz away a lot of time getting ready, can't you? How many of you can futz and futz? Yeah. You're ready to go, turn on the lamp, and start studying. The moment you lose your edge, 15, 20, 30 minutes later, turn the lamp off, get up, and leave the desk. What you're training yourself to study while seated there. And it becomes increasingly automatic, as did the raising of the hand. You sit, turn the lamp on, and you're ready to go. It's like magic. The students who did that were one grade point higher the next term compared to the control group that didn't do it one grade point simply by creating a study area. Now, if you study in the kitchen dining, remove all food cues, because I know what happens there. You start thinking, turkey in the fridge. So it's a kind of a longish point there to make, but it's an important point, which is that, yes, your environment really makes a big difference to your focus and your behaviors in general. And this is all kind of modern behavioral change and recommendations. You should really be focused on trying to change your environment. And obviously it's the same for 
you know, getting distracted by things and procrastinating. A few things that I'll add onto this, the principles in theory are perfectly sound, like nothing really has changed too much since this talk, but a lamp is great. I've actually got a lamp right here on my desk as well that I turn on when I really need to get my focused work done. But there's a few other things like having a good set of headphones that, you know, like a Bluetooth, like noise canceling headphones. There's a very specific app that I personally use to create like white noise and block out those types of distractions. I think it's just called white noise light or something white noise light or white noise app or something like that and so that's just an app that i'll use to create kind of like a auditory focus zone if you do study in your bedroom do not study in your bed like you know marty is saying it's honestly a really really bad thing to do and i know a lot of people do it i know it's comfortable but that's not the point like it's going to ruin your sleep and it's going to ruin your studying like once you start ruining your sleep and your study simultaneously by studying in bed it's such an uphill battle to try to fight against that so don't do that turn your desk away from the bed another thing that you can try to find is like screen dividers or dressing room dividers they're basically these like fold out kind of panels and uh, you can pick them up off like you know like amazon or somewhere for like five ten bucks and uh, you can just stick them against a wall when you're not using them but then when you do need to use them you put them behind your desk like behind your chair to create almost like a little cubicle of focus for yourself and then you can have your you know your lamp on and your headphones on and it creates a really 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 great like focused environment what i used to do is i used to also put kind of old blankets over the dividers as well so it actually creates like a thick like more soundproof wall. Anyway, these are some of the things that you can do, but you wanna to try to manipulate and change that environment as much as possible. As you can see, obviously here, I like this is my office, this is my space. I do not recreate at all in this area. Like this is an area I use only for work and study. If I'm just chilling, I'll take my laptop and I'll take it upstairs. If I want to play games, like I've, I've got a PlayStation. I bought a PlayStation because I do not want to actually play games on my you know, MacBook or my desktop or whatever it is. Like I want to have a dedicated space and a dedicated console for just like chilling out and playing games. A few little tips. Yeah, Swiss cheese in the fridge. Oh yeah. Sand when you're reading it over and over or saying it over and over, the term for that is rote memorization, spelled R-O-T-E. It can work. It is the way most of us were taught in elementary school. The way I understand it, a lot of Asian schools depend heavily on rote. And some of you may be darn good at it. And if you can memorize and actually understand by repetition and it's effective for you, don't change. But for most of us, it's not the most efficient or effective way. I would argue just you should still change. <laughs> there's just, there's no benefit. The way to learn efficiently in college, first you have to decide, what am I learning? Is it a concept? Wait, so just one, one thing is that most people don't know how to know if they understand something. And this is the problem with a lot of like speed reading techniques is that they say, oh, not only am I increasing my reading speed, but my comprehension is also really high. How do you even measure your comprehension? What does comprehension even mean? You got to understand that when you test someone's comprehension, we say that word as if it means something else, but it's not. It is actually just learning. And it is incredibly difficult to test someone's learning at all the different levels that you need to test it at. A lot of these, you know, techniques they say oh, i'm going to double or triple your reading speed and then your comprehension is going to be 80 90 you know 100 percent but then the way that they're testing the comprehension is just like literal like cued fact recall and it's like to be honest that is the least important type of comprehension to even test on so there's an issue is that if you are relying a lot on these like rote memorization repetitive strategies then you're probably not even aware that you need to test your understanding of that knowledge at different levels of complexity as well. And if you are doing that, then you're probably not using this method because you'd realize how limited it is. Fact. A fact is a discrete little piece of information. Sigmund Freud is the father of psychoanalysis. That's a fact, okay? But understanding what psychoanalysis is, is a concept, okay? Understanding the name of a bone is a fact. Understanding what it does in the body gets into a concept, okay? So in studying, sometimes there are a lot of facts. In fact, I use anatomy as a good example. You gotta memorize bones, muscles, organs, tissues, a lot of it. But if you simply memorize and don't understand the function of it, the comprehension of the actual concepts, it's a lot of wasted learning, really. Just to know the name of a bone is like, yeah, so what, okay? What does it do, how does it function? So if it's a fact or a factoid, you have to approach it one way, and I'll talk about how you do that. But in most college classes, what we as professors are most concerned about is that you grasp the concept. Because concepts, once grasped, will stay with you a lifetime. Facts can easily get confused, but that's why we have Google, why we have reference books. If you know the concept, you can quickly look up the fact if you have to know that for a particular fact. The neat thing is, I get questions, who has more advantage, younger students or older students? Depends on what you're talking about. 
Most of us, as we get older, realize concepts are what are really important to make our lives better, to be effective in our work, to be effective in our personal lives. Facts, though, we realize we can look up. We can get those if we need them. Young people actually often learn facts very quickly, but they never think about the concept. I'll give you a simple example. I'm an old guy. Okay, so I do have some things that respectfully I want to call out and point out about what Marty Lobdell has just said here. First of all, it is an oversimplification to think about learning as either facts versus concepts. And, you know, the research on this has, has been out for like since 1999 and uh, then 2001, then it was reviewed again in 2007. So like by the time this talk was made, there was enough research around this to kind of not oversimplify it to this point. It's, it's a different thing to know a fact. It's a different thing to know a concept. And I agree completely with everything that he's talking about in terms of the fact that facts really aren't as important. But then there's another thing in terms of how you're able to use those facts and how you're able to use those concepts and whether the way that you understand it is the same way that you would use it. And then how those different facts and concepts relate to each other. And that's actually where the, the peak knowledge is. And, and probably if, you know, Marty Lobdell ever watches this video, which I doubt he ever will, but... He probably knows that, like intuitively, that it's not just the understanding of the concept, it's the understanding and the implication of that concept and its impact that it has on other concepts. And that's what true expertise and mastery is, which I'm sure he already knows, but he just didn't explain it that way. Now, the difficult part is that when, especially for, he talks about how young people really focus on facts a lot. It's, a lot of that is because a lot of assessments really emphasize these facts. And a lot of teachers actually tell people to memorize facts. So young people are kind of like led astray by a lot of bad advice and by what apparently is important, which is apparently I should learn all these facts because clearly that's the way that I'm tested on it. The skill is about being able to learn all your facts without sacrificing the ability to gain the true expertise. And indeed, as you get older, especially beyond uni and the you know, advanced like postgraduate degrees, the facts really do become very, very non-important to the point where you can kind of just skim over most of those facts. Here we go. I'm gonna to read to you 13 letters from our alphabet. You all know the alphabet, right? Should be meaningful. As soon as I finish, I want you to say them back to me in the same sequence that I give them to you. So I'll say them and then I'll go like that, just say them back. Why? T, R, H, don't write them, A, U, S, P, D, P, A, Y, H. Boy, somebody sounded like they got quite, you remember, and I sit in front of classes where they just go, for 50 minutes I'm giving them wisdom and they're not taking a damn note. And then they wonder why they don't remember. You can't remember everything in a lecture. I'm gonna rearrange the letters a little bit, see if you do any better. A, R, S, most of you got all 13. And you thought coming to this lecture you might gain nothing expanded to 13. Can you give them again? What are they? Damn, you're good. <laughs> or I'm good. Now, obviously, it was a little easier. Those were the same 13 letters. Same ones. If you're studying anything conceptual and you're trying to memorize it, it's like Y, T, R. It doesn't make any sense. It's in one eye, out the other. If it's out loud, one ear, out the other. But if you take the time to discover the meaning in it, suddenly it clicks. And I could probably ask you next week, what were the 13 letters? And most of you tell me. At the end of the quarter, I could ask you, most of you could tell me. You might be confused, was it Happy Wednesday or Thursday? But you'd guess probably Thursday. Now, some of you are in my intro class this quarter. I do something that I wish I had time to do. I divide the class in two, using a card so half reads one, the other half reads another card. I have one group try to estimate the number of vowels in a series of words that I read to them. So they're thinking about the words, but we'd say that's superficial thinking. How many vowels in mosquito? How many vowels in bottle? How many vowels in elephant? And they get to write down what they think is the number of vowels. The second group are instructed, they're told you need to think about how valuable this item would be if you were stranded on a deserted island. And you then rate its value on a five point scale. One being no value, five being highly valuable. That's called deeper processing. You're now thinking about it in terms of its application or use. By the way, I always think elephant is a fun one. I'd give it a five, okay? Not only company, but if you got really hungry, you got a lot of food there, right? I then read, I think it's about 30 words. Everybody's writing down their numbers. I then have them do a stalling exercise where they write their name, phone number, and address. That's to dump short term memory because they might be thinking about the words I just read. If you're now writing your name and address, it changes your focus. Short-term memory only lasts about 20 to 30 seconds. It's pretty brief. So I count it on the clock after 30 seconds. I say, now, write down as many words that you can recall. This one is so powerful. The group that's counting vowels, on average, remembers five out of about 30 words, time and time again. The group that's thinking about the usefulness on a deserted island remembers 10, okay? It's slightly more, 5.5 five, 5. 5 versus 10.5, but very close to a doubling without doing any more effort, 
simply by thinking about it instead of just trying to superficially think about it. This okay, really important points here. Interesting, he says not without any more effort because it is actually more cognitive effort. And actually that's the point. So it, like he sort of actually contradicted himself, I think unintentionally because he said before, like trying to create meaning is one of the biggest struggles of learning. And then now he sort of talks about the fact that it doesn't take effort, but that, that is the effort. So the second activity, which is about assigning value to something, that is one of the most important things to do in learning. And you'll see this principle come up in my videos constantly, which is that an effective technique isn't just about finding relationships and comparing things to each other, you have to actually make a value judgment about how important it is. That forces you to prioritize, and that is the higher order learning that I always talk about. When you're making a value judgment, you have to then think about it in relation to other things, in relation to a context, in relation to a bigger picture. It forces it to be not only part of a network, but to understand its position and strength within that network. You know, it's a great demonstration of this particular activity, but it does take more mental effort than the superficial learning usually does, especially when you're studying complex concepts over a long period of time, it is more mental effort. And the problem is that people don't know that it's meant to take more effort and that effort is good for you. And so they kind of avoid that. And that's what I, again, something that I talk about very often, which is a misinterpreted effort hypothesis. So the other thing is that he talked about how, you know, he had the letters, you know, like happy Thursday, and uh, it was like, you know, what are the letters and how are you trying to memorize them? A really interesting analogy that we can draw from that, which is completely like relevant for the real world, is that when you learn something in a curriculum, there is an assumption that the order in which you are presented information is a good order for you to learn it in. And it is usually not. And, and you actually have to understand that the order that is best for you and for your brain is probably going to be different to the order it was presented to you or the way that it is in a textbook or something like that. And reordering information is a crucial part of learning effectively to figure out what is happy Thursday, because what makes sense in this case, happy Thursday, everyone understands that it makes sense for everyone. Everyone is, has the right order that makes it easier for them. But for knowledge, that's not the case because what makes sense for you, for knowledge depends on what you already know. So the right order that makes the most sense for you is gonna be different sometimes to what makes sense for another person. And so figuring out your best order also takes time and thinking about why is this valuable? How important is it? That is a great question to ask yourself when you're studying to help you figure out what is the right order because you want to learn the things that you think are the most important and make the most sense and that are the most logical and intuitive and you want to continue to chain that together. This is where as a student, the more you get into the understanding, the better. Now this then raises a fun question. What is the meaning of meaning? If I say something is meaningful or meaningless, what am I really saying? I'm not going to go through a big drill, which is kind of fun of teasing it out of you. But a meaningful piece is a piece that relates to something you already know. And the best little analogy is it's like a file system that you've already got established, you add a new entry to it. So it's all neatly organized. And it's very easy if you've got a file system to add a new entry. We do it with computers also. Uh, almost good analogy, because the file system, I would recommend not thinking about your memory like a filing system, because a filing system suggests that knowledge can only exist in one cabinet, and that those cabinets are separate from each other. I would encourage people to think about it a little bit more like, like a jigsaw puzzle that you're trying to build. Each piece of the puzzle fits somewhere and it belongs somewhere. And to find it, let's say you want to find the piece related to a particular cloud in the sky in your jigsaw puzzle. You know where to find that because you know that clouds are in the sky, which tends to be higher up on the puzzle. And you know the clouds are in the left corner. And that's where you look for it. So you can retrieve it because you know where it is but its position is relative to all the other positions and it's not necessarily like you can categorize it however you want to categorize it. And it's not like a fixed isolated kind of thing like a filing system is. The other way, now, as a teacher, I think all of us, or as we are teachers, we all try to make things meaningful in our classes. So we give stories, we give examples, but sometimes our examples don't work for you. This is where you have to tease it out. So I'm gonna go to a couple things to help you there. First, study groups. We underutilize them, especially community college. Would people get through med school without study groups? <laughs> Not very many. Uh, do we have vet tech back there? Dental hygiene, vet tech. Pretty sophisticated stuff they have to learn, right? Do they do study groups? No? Oh my. I would hope they do. I would encourage them to do it. Where I've got students to form study groups, performance of the groups go up dramatically. 
Now, part of it is probably because they're motivated to do that, so it's a bit confounded. But I'm convinced there's also the power of studying with other people. I know these concepts in psych so well, I can't see how they're confusing. But another student who's just found the answer can sometimes turn and say, Thursday, here's what it's about. And you go, ah, is that what Mr. Lobdell was saying? God, so easy. But I can't do that because I don't see where the problems lie in that particular concept. Study groups are great, OK? I'm not going to tell you how many of you totally hurt yourself in studying. I like kind of agree, but also kind of disagree with that. Study groups can be helpful, but also study groups can be a waste of time as well if you're not using them correctly. I don't know if I've got a video on my channel about that, but if I don't, I, I will make another one talking a little bit more about how to extract the most out of study groups. I see a lot of people use study groups kind of like an excuse to not study. You know, they're trying to make study groups so that studying becomes easier, but you can't really avoid the mental effort involved in learning properly. The study group should actually enhance your ability to face the difficulties of learning more productively, not kind of create an illusion that you're learning because you're having some conversations with people. And the other thing is also, just because someone explains something to you in a way that makes sense doesn't mean that you can then create that explanation yourself when you need to. And this is the, an illusion of learning as well. In fact, you already probably know this, that just because someone explains something to you and it makes sense when they explain it doesn't mean that you can create that explanation. Otherwise, studying would honestly be really easy. As soon as you understand anything, you would just remember it and be able to retrieve it. In fact, that's kind of the easy part of studying. The difficult part of studying is the process from going from understanding to being able to retrieve from memory at different levels of complexity. So it's not really as simple as that. If you magic mark, highlight, whatever you call it, your textbooks, the little yellow, pink, green, glow-in-the-dark sort of thing. How many of you use the markers? Those were invented in 65, the year I started college. So I bought one. I turned entire books ugly orange. And then I figured it out. If you color the page solid orange, you've actually highlighted nothing. Yeah, by highlighting everything, you've really highlighted zip. So I did the clever thing, and you guys are way ahead of me. What do you highlight, folks? The most important thing. When do you do it? When you first read the book, right, or the chapter. So you read through, are you studying? No, I'm reading for the most important thing. Zip, zip, zip. And some of you get out rulers to make it really neat, take hours to make pretty little. Then you go back to the start of the chapter. You read the first thing you underlined, and you go, oh, I remember that. No, you don't. You recognize it. Mm. People are incredible at confusing recognition with recollection. Your visual recognition threshold is so great, you can see a person once, see them years later, and go, I know you. Were you a student at Pierce College? Yeah. Did you take psych? Yeah. From lab? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 36 years I ran into that, okay? Proof of this, grab a magazine in your house that you haven't looked at for a while, leaf through it, you will get the illusion of remembering virtually every advertisement and article. But to prove that it's not recollection, it's actually- You know, it's really simple to prove this. It's like, you can take like a dollar bill or you know, your local currency, and if someone shows it to you, you can see it and you can recognize it immediately. But if you wanted to draw it, very, very few people would know it well enough to actually draw what a dollar bill looks like accurately, even if you've seen it thousands of times in your life. And this is the case for most of the things that we you know, have in our, in our life that we can recognize. You could have, you know, like your phone, you've, you've got your phone in your hand and you're using it like every single moment of every single day. But if you need to actually draw exactly what that phone looks like, you might actually struggle, you might miss a few things. So this is again, it's one of those illusions of learning is recognition is not the same thing as recollection. The recognition, before you turn to the next page, predict what's on it, there's no way you're gonna be right. As soon as you turn, you go, oh, I remember that. No, you don't. You recognize it. Now, going back to your book, you've highlighted the most important stuff. You now go back to study. And that is exactly the reason why you shouldn't check your answers to an exam straight away. And then if you feel like, oh, it makes sense, not like review the material. When you do a question and you get it wrong or you don't feel confident, there is a knowledge gap there. What your answer sheet says is like almost irrelevant. Let's say you feel unconfident and then your answer sheet says that you got it right you were still not confident. You just got lucky. So you still need to review that knowledge gap. Let's say that you got it wrong and then you read the answers and then you're like, oh, that answer makes sense. I know that, I just made a silly mistake. No, you got it wrong. If you knew it, you would have gotten it right. So that is a knowledge gap. So a lot of the time I see people saying, I make all these silly mistakes in exams all the time. I very, very rarely see true silly mistakes. Almost always they are knowledge gaps that went either undetected because they didn't test themselves or they were detected but ignored because they thought it's just a silly mistake. I'm not going to make this mistake. And yes, in the real exam, you may not make that same mistake. You're just going to make a different one that's basically the same thing. Study it and you say, oh, I remember it. So do you study it? No. So what don't you learn? 
the most important part of the chapter. And then they him. I shake my head and think, poor baby, you think you knew it, but in fact, you recognized it. You didn't know it. Now back to this active learning. How do you know you know it? If you can look at it, go to the next one, read it, and then stop and go back to the one before. Look up in the sky and in your own words, say what that was about. Yeah, you know it. You will not forget it overnight unless you suffer a pretty major cerebral accident. It just doesn't happen. But while we're talking about this, just not correct. Like he said, short-term memory is very, very short, but we know that the knowledge decay is, you know, obviously a real thing. The way that your brain forgets information is not necessarily linear or predictable all the time. Learning is just really complicated. And but actually to my Lobdell's credit, a lot of the research around like the nuances around forgetting and spacing and memory, I think 12 years ago wasn't very strong. But just because you can remember something from looking up with what's, you know, this is essentially free recall or uncued recall, depending on what it is. Just because you can demonstrate that once or twice doesn't actually mean that you're going to have good retention of that for, uh, you know, much longer. Those of you that have lots of flashcards, you know, this is the case because you have a flashcard that you got right, you got right, you got right. And then you give it like a, a day and then like suddenly you just like didn't remember it anymore. And it feels kind of random that that happens. Most of you undo good studying by not sleeping adequately. Some of the latest work on REMing, we're not sure exactly how, but there's something going on. It involves the hippocampus. It involves the storage from a transitory long-term memory to a permanent, what we call consolidation. That just labels it, doesn't really say what's happening. But we're getting increasing evidence that that consolidation process is dependent on rapid eye movement sleep, which if you're an adult happens about every hour and a half once you fall asleep. If you're not getting a good night, typically around eight hours, you're not getting enough REM. What you've studied doesn't become permanent. And I can tell you there are studies to show simply by getting better rest. Some students improve markedly in their performance because their brain now stores it a lot more efficiently. Everything he has said is the same as it is now. We still don't know why it happens. We now call it sleep dependent memory consolidation and it is dependent on REM and have no room more answers in terms of like the mechanism behind it. Well, not really. And it is still just as important. And I have all the time people leaving comments on my YouTube videos and on Instagram and on TikTok and whatever. And if you're not following me on those, then you really should. But they always say like, hey, I'm sleeping like four or five hours and I'm not really like studying you know, very effectively. What's the technique that I should use? It's like the technique you should use is to sleep more. When you are sleep deprived, nothing else really matters. Sleep deficiency has such a profound impact on your ability to learn that it's kind of like having like a whole arm that's cut off and you're just hemorrhaging blood all over the walls and all over the floor. And you've got like a bleeding nose and you're thinking like, what can I do to stop my bleeding nose? Like, buddy, you got bigger problems to worry about than a bleeding nose. The, you know, fix the source of the hemorrhage. And if you're, if you're sleep deprived, I know it's difficult to fix it practically, like sleep apnea or insomnia can actually be really challenging. And you may actually need to see your GP or a psychologist, someone to give you some techniques to really get on top of it, but it is very, very worth it. It's not always easy. And sometimes you got to sacrifice. Like if you're not sleeping enough because you're studying so much, you actually just need to study less. Just try to be more efficient. Just literally just make a decision to study less. And if that means that you don't do as well or you don't feel as confident or you don't feel as secure or whatever it is, you just deal with it, study less, sleep more, and then start working on the other things. Trust me. Trust me. This is coming from someone that has had a lot of experience with sleep deprivation in my personal life as well as obviously professionally. By the way, if you know anybody with sleep apnea, the biggest thing they'll tell you is I can't remember anything. My brain shot for sleep because they don't make any money. I tell students and they go, yeah, that's nice. But they continue to use their time for other things. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? The best advice, sleep better. And most of you will do better. Most of you won't even begin to take it. And I know why. You got so many other things to do. I'd ask you this. Are they important? Is studying and learning the most important thing you're doing as a student? If so, maybe you need to give up some of the other activities. I have students tell me, I don't have enough time. There's two, what, 162 hours in a week? We all have the same amount of time. Marty has no more, no less than anybody in this room. The real question is, what do I do with my 162 hours? Am I gonna use it well or use it not so well? Okay, I'm gonna give you a couple other tips here. Taking notes, so vital. But most students who do it haven't learned a very simple rule. The first moment you get after a class, ideally right after the class, you should sit down with your notes and expand on everything you jotted down. Give it depth, flesh it out, okay? If you even wait to go home and do it a couple hours later, you'll have forgotten some of your own notes. How many of you have done that? You've written beautiful notes, you get them home, you don't know what the hell you wrote. Big difference here. Yes, this is true, 
because in this instance, we're presuming that their first encounter with the information happens during the class or the lecture, in which case you are fighting against an incredibly rapid knowledge decay rate. So literally minutes after you leave that room, you're starting to forget stuff and you will forget stuff very quickly, especially like classes and university lectures, which are usually very dense. There's a lot of information that was packed in there and you're gonna forget a lot of it very quickly. The most effective thing that you can do to fight that is not just to consolidate it straight away. It's to make sure that you're doing your pre-study and priming. When you give your brain some of the anchor points of the concepts and main ideas so it knows how to think about and organize that information, it means that as you are learning, you know how to file it away and create meaning out of it, which means that you fundamentally encode it to a higher quality, so therefore you're going to hold on to that information more easily. Whenever someone says that they're feeling overwhelmed in class or in lectures, almost 100% of the time, it's because of inadequate priming. If you take that to the extreme, it would be studying the entire lecture fully before you even attend the lecture. Obviously, you're not gonna get overwhelmed by a lecture where you're not learning anything new. You don't have to do it to that level. So the question is, well, where do you draw the line? At what point is it not worth it to cover the lecture to that level of depth? And often you can spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes getting a basic idea of the biggest pictures and, and concepts within that lecture, form a general map of it. And if you can form a general map of not just those concepts, but also the wider topic as well. And then when you go into the lecture, you'll find that it is vastly easier to handle it without being overwhelmed. And I would say if you are feeling overwhelmed in class or in lecture, this is the first place to look at. In fact, like I can almost guarantee that is where the solution to this problem is gonna be. It's like, what is this? Okay, well that's a wasted. Activity can also take the form of recitation. How many of you know the best way to learn is to teach somebody else? Well, if you've got family members or roommates, teach them geography, psychology, anatomy. They often love it. One of my dearest students two years ago, I, God, I just loved her. I finally met her parents. She says, I've heard so much about you. I hear every lecture you've given. She would come home, sit around the dinner table and recapitulate what I talked about. It's powerful because it reinforces your learning. Plus it tells you if you really understood it. Because if mom or dad says, well, I don't quite get that. You go, uh, I don't understand it either. <laughs> then very quickly you have to go back and redo it. Teaching another person. Now, some of you may not have anybody at home to teach, or they're not interested. Too bad. Teach an empty chair. There's nothing wrong with talking out loud. Thinking is internal talking to a large degree. There's also non-talking thinking. Talking out loud, as long as you know you're doing it, is not abnormal. If you think it's somebody else, or it's a real person in an empty chair, talk with me. I'll, I'll try to get you lined up with someone who can help. If you have roommates or friends say, I'm just doing this little Socratic thing where I'm going to explain it to an empty chair. Dialogue with that empty chair. Practice it. Now, for some of you, writing it out in your own words. So all of that, what he said about teaching, very, very good advice. Teaching is a great way to have that active retrieval. And again, I'm going to extend that a little further to say, don't teach people that take the same subject as you. You don't want to be teaching someone that already has knowledge about the subject, especially if they've got more knowledge than you. Because gaps in your ability to explain, you need to be able to figure that out and if the other person is filling in the gaps themselves based on what they already know, if they're kind of just playing along, that's actually not very helpful for you. It would be better to have just taught the empty chair because at least with the empty chair, you have to be the one to judge whether what you've taught actually makes sense. It's a good thing. I'm lazy. I want to talk about textbooks. I brought the one I'm using in intro right now. Most students have not been taught how to use a textbook and yet it's such a powerful tool. Because they have been taught the power of the tool, a large percentage don't even buy the book in part because they're getting so darn expensive. Over a hundred bucks for this little puppy here, I believe. And there you have it. In 2012, it cost a hundred bucks to buy a textbook. You can't see because the screen is covering it. But this shelf of textbooks here is probably like three to four thousand dollars of textbooks. Did it provide me three to four thousand dollars worth of education? These books are designed for what's called pedagogy. That's a fancy way of saying helping you learn. And they are seriously done to be, at least according to the people doing it, the most effective way of teaching. But students Actually, yeah, let me just say this. Textbooks are honestly kind of a scam. They're like way too expensive for what they are. Like we live in a modern day with like Google. We should not be paying the hundreds to like, you know, like multi hundreds of dollars for a textbook. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I think these publishers are honestly kind of a scam. And this is coming from someone, like I've actually written chapters in textbooks. Not that I really got any money from that. Students don't know the effective way of using it. How many of you know of SQ3R? None, one, two. I assumed all my students were still learning this until a few years ago I asked, it died out. There's also an SQ4R, there's a newer version of it, which uh, I'm not so familiar with. SQ3R, survey, that's the S. Question, that's the Q. Then you have three R's, read, recite, review. 
And we were taught this because they knew pedagogically way back in those dark ages of the 60s that you retain much more from a text if you survey, question, read, recite, or recite, and review. So how do you do the survey? These are not novels. In a novel, you wouldn't want to read the last page, would you? FYI, this SQ3R or SQ, SQP3R, I think, is effective. It is actually one of the first learning strategies I myself learned. And I can't remember exactly where I learned it from. It was kind of serendipitous and I picked this up and it is actually effective. And now there are other methods that have been developed that are like take it to the next level. So it's a little, I would say outdated, but most people don't even do this version. You know, so if, if you've never heard of this before and you're wanting just like a quick fix to help with your studying, this is like Feynman technique and this, these are like two of the easiest, simplest things that you can apply straight away that give you an immediate result, honestly. Like if I had, if I could only tell someone to use two things and I, they only had like four hours to master the techniques, I'd say Feynman technique, is you three are. Find out who done it, it ruined the whole thing. But this is a textbook. So what you do is you actually go through the entire chapter. You look at pictures, okay? What's this about apples? What's this about a duckbill platypus? Okay, and what you're doing is you survey, you ask questions. What are formal concepts? What's a superordinate concept? What are natural concepts? Prototypes, what is a prototype? So you raise questions as you go through. It only takes a couple of minutes to survey a chapter in any class, okay? As you're surveying, you simultaneously raise questions. What you're doing then is causing you to be looking for answers. And this is a powerful thing. How many of you have noticed when you're looking through a newspaper for a piece of information, you can find it, it kind of jumps out at you? But if you're just kind of reading it haphazardly, kind of casually, most of what you read you don't even remember. There's something about it and I can't explain it, I can only describe it. If you intend to find something, you find it. And I've got a little demonstration I could have brought where I actually show a placard with the words Boston and London printed on them. And I hold it up for 20 seconds. Out of a group this size, maybe two or three of you'd see Boston and London. Because before I do it, I tell you to look for letters, symbols, and numbers. I create what's called a set. You're now expecting not to see words, but letters. And even though Boston and London are printed on diagonal, most people don't see it. Likewise, if you just kind of go through a book without asking questions first, you kind of skiz over the content. You don't have the search mechanism going, okay? The reading followed by the recitation, I talked about that. Technically, before a test, it should be review. It should be in the barn. Now you're just touching up to make sure you haven't lost anything or confused anything. But I know how this works. Because we schedule tests, most students don't start studying until shortly before an exam. And much like my friend, they put so much time all massed together and only study for about a half hour, pull all-nighters so they don't get the good rest, come in and do poorly. You're undoing yourself. If you start studying early and do some of the things I've talked about, by the time you get to the test, you're just reviewing at that point, not truly studying. Okay, use the book correctly, SQ3R. Okay, I got one last thing and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it. You've gotta memorize facts. How do you do that? And I love it because I get a lot of students from anatomy coming to me going, I can't remember. What you use, mnemonics. In my view, they're quicker, easier than rote memorization, and I do use them. Mnemonics come in several flavors. We have uh, acronyms. We have the coined sayings. And interacting images. There are other types of mnemonics. Technically, taking notes is a mnemonic because a mnemonic is any system that facilitates recall. Most of what I've been talking about are technically mnemonics. But these are more formal, okay? How many of you have learned that you can take letters and form a word of it, of using those letters to remember certain facts? Okay, uh, ones that come to my mind, Roy G. Biv. How many of you know about Roy G. Biv? <laughs> you know. Those are the colors of the rainbow. Now, if you're in an art class, that could be important. If you're taking physics and you're learning about the spectrum of light when it goes through a prism, where you're breaking down light and anything that refracts it out, like a rainbow, you know. Colors are what? The longest mnemonic that I ever used was to memorize the elements of the periodic table. And I don't know if there is a better way to do this. And I never really bothered to look because I was like 16 and just dumb. <laughs> um, and so my friend taught me the first part and it went, Harry, he likes beer, but cups not over full. That takes you to probably like, like fluorine probably. And then to fill out the remaining for the first 20 elements, I then just pronounced, <laughs> just pronounced the elements as it's written on the periodic table. So it went, Harry, he likes beer, but cups not over full. Then a mig al cypus And I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. 
And that takes you to the first 20 elements of the periodic table. And uh, I memorized that mnemonic when I was 16. And I promise I haven't been repeating that every, you know, like few months for the last 15 years. So mnemonics work. They are very, very powerful. Like, you know, these acronyms and coin sayings and all these things, they're very effective and you should 100% use them when it's appropriate. What I would recommend though, is just don't go too overboard with your mnemonics. Mnemonics are great when what you need to learn is a very isolated list and you know that the way you need to use that information is like a checklist. For example, a mnemonic that I used to use all the time was when I was diagnosing a patient that came in with chest pain. And so there was a mnemonic that was called TEPID, T-E-P-I-D. They stand for different conditions that are potentially life-threatening and common enough that you need to look for them. Tension pneumothorax, esophageal varus rupture, pulmonary embolism, ischemic heart disease, and the dissection, aortic dissection. So like, see, this, you know, these are mnemonics that I use all the time. And it's effective because it's like a checklist. But let's say that you've got other types of information. It's just like a list of information, a list of facts. But you know that the way you use that information is not like a checklist, but rather you actually need to know those facts individually to pull them, to connect them to other bits of information or manipulate them in some other way. Mnemonics aren't going to be the best way to do that because when you learn something through a mnemonic, you are packaging it and storing that package, which is effective, but it means if you need to use the things that are inside that package, it's not very efficient because you need to take the package, open up the package, look at each thing, and then consciously connect it together. If it's something that needs to be connected anyway, it's better to chunk and package it in a way that includes that connection and relationship through some other method of learning of which, you know, there's many different alternatives. So mnemonics are great, but again, just know what they're useful for and use them appropriately. Because you can get to the point where you've got so many mnemonics that you actually forget what your mnemonics even mean, or you've got mnemonics just to remember mnemonics. Easy. Now, how long would you have? I'm going to go with one, and you can help me on this. 12 cranial nerves. Give me the saying. One of the probably most powerful, technically mnemonics, but I don't really talk about them as mnemonics, that you can use is to create analogies. When you try to create an analogy for something, Again, it's, it's quite complicated and this video is already pretty long, so I'm just gonna cut to it. Just use analogies. It's very, very powerful. It is one of the strongest, most powerful memory aid techniques that you can use that also tests your higher order learning and understanding of it. Because to create a good analogy, it has to be accurate, it has to be comprehensive, and it has to be consistent. Otherwise, it's not an analogy. Like I can't say learning is like eating a salty piece of bread. Sometimes when you eat it, it's really hard to chew it and swallow it. It's like, okay, sure. But salt is like a flavor. Is learning kind of like a flavor? You know, like if the analogy is only suitable for like one tiny line of thought, it's not a very good analogy. You want an analogy that's like very, very robust. So like sometimes I'll talk about learning being like solving a jigsaw puzzle. That's a great analogy because of the fact that it's accurate and it applies consistently for lots of different facets of how learning works. And so using analogies, again, it's a little bit more effortful than thinking of an acronym or just a saying for it. But a lot of the time, if you are needing to understand information in a way that's a little bit more complex and higher order than just a cognitive checklist, then an analogy would be one of my first go-to things that I'd recommend. So that was it, a talk viewed 22 million times by the prolific Professor Emeritus, Marty Lobdell, you know, an absolute legend. And I know that I've been criticizing a lot of, you know, what he's been talking about and adding my own kind of points, but I do so with the utmost respect. He has contributed a lot. And at the time when he made this video, the research was not as good as it is now. I mean, there's probably more that we've learned about how learning works in the last 10 years than the last 50 years before that combined. So well deserving of 22 million views, I liked it. And I think there's a very interesting points uh, and nuances that I've been able to point out. I'm gonna wrap it up there because this video is long as heck already and I'm getting hungry personally. <laughs> I need to go have dinner. But anyway, if you're looking for a place to start with my videos so you can get a little bit more deep on some of the topics that I've talked about today, then check out this playlist that I've created for you. But otherwise, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.